Greetings and welcome. Today I'm going to attempt to answer a number of the questions that have reoccurred in the comment sections of my videos. And I'll also present my current theories regarding the how and why of what I've found regarding both the great titan Montgo as well as the plethora of stone hearts and petrified organs that I've covered in several videos now. But first, I'd like to take you on a brief journey through the events, synchronicities, and thinking that led to these incredible discoveries. Two years ago, I began a line of questioning that led to insights I could never have imagined. In 2017, I came across some videos on YouTube that were challenging the very foundations of geology. Shortly after, I was exposed to theories about mud fossils and the idea that flesh and bone could fossilize and petrify in incredibly short periods of time given the right conditions. I also learned that a great many researchers throughout the years have found numerous faults with the gold standard techniques used by geologists for determining the age of things. Geological dating is a cornerstone of the cosmological model we've been given and taught in schools, and the conclusions drawn by geologists regarding the age of the stones and strata offer foundational validation to the claims of astrophysicists regarding the age of the Earth and the known universe. But what if their conclusions are off by orders of magnitude? Carbon dating, for example, is known to be very unreliable as samples move beyond thousands of years of age. And using layers of strata as a method for determining the age of something is a technique that stands on equally shaky ground. Nevertheless, strata are regularly used to justify timelines stretching to hundreds of millions of years, despite multiple flaws in the theory. It wasn't long after being exposed to these new ideas that I began to consider the possibility that much of the stone we see might have originally had biological origins. One channel on YouTube even claimed to have found humanoid DNA in multiple stone samples in tests performed by supposedly reputable laboratories. While contemplating the implications of this fascinating information, I stumbled across a video called Petrified Titans on the YouTube channel JDreamers. At first, the idea that titans once existed seemed absurd. After all, how could something so monumental, so titanic, have possibly been missed by geologists for so long? But with some of the major tenets of geology already potentially up for grabs, I decided to keep an open mind. Jay's presentation included photographs of mountains around the world that looked a great deal like the petrified remains of gigantic beings. While rather fantastic, it piqued my curiosity and was the final spark that ultimately led to what has become a two-year study of the mountain here in Spain called Montgo. This mountain, affectionately known as the Elephant by locals, has long captured my imagination. It's beautiful from every angle. It also happens to look a great deal like an elephant lying face down. Up until this point, despite the uncanny resemblance to an elephant, it never actually occurred to me that it might be the remains of a titanic creature. One would have to be crazy to believe such things, right? Anyway, it wasn't long before my curiosity began to get the best of me, and I decided to look into it further. I started off initially by touring the mountain using Google Earth's aerial 3D views. I was already well aware of the concept of pareidolia, where an observer recognizes patterns that don't actually exist, and are nothing more than a trick of the eyes or the mind. It's easy to fool ourselves, especially when one is emotionally attached to a particular outcome when investigating. Having two college degrees under my belt, one of them a five-year degree in chiropractic, I'm somewhat familiar with the scientific method. I'm also well familiar with anatomy, physiology, and histology, the study of tissues. Not wanting to play the fool, I decided to approach my study of the mountain as rationally as I could. It never occurred to me that it would lead to any groundbreaking revelations or that I would someday be sharing my findings with the world. But here I am, and as of today, I produce five videos presenting my discoveries in a series entitled Unveiling a Titan. Those five videos represent a top-to-bottom, inside-and-out, macroscopic and microscopic forensic analysis of the mountain. To date, 
I've compiled and presented photographic and video evidence of no less than 50 specific anatomical correlations between vertebrate anatomy and the various structures found on and inside the mountain. Taken as a whole, these videos offer extremely compelling evidence that Mont Go was once indeed a titanic creature of some sort. For the detailed breakdown of the evidence gathered, be sure to watch the series. If you are a skeptic, and I believe you should be, suspend your judgment and watch the videos. By part 3, I guarantee you'll be shaking your head. By part 4, you'll likely be a believer. And part 5 is just the icing on the cake. I'd like to make it clear that I'm not attached to the idea of Montgo being specifically an elephant. It could very well be some other sort of creature. And until there's further testing, DNA analysis, ground penetrating radar, or some sort of a test a titan kit available for purchase at the local drugstore, we won't know for sure. What I do know is that there are an astonishing number of very specific anatomical correlations that match up perfectly with elephant anatomy, which is quite astonishing given Montgo's overall appearance. After my initial Google Earth tour of the mountain, I was quite surprised to find a variety of anatomical features that match the macro anatomy of an elephant. The shape of the head and upper back were perfect, the shape and location of the eye equally so. There were curved cutouts on both sides of the mountain where the space between the head and shoulder would have been. Faint lines suggested the remains of ribs on both sides. And just behind the eye I noticed a change in color of the stone in the shape of a quarter moon exactly where an ear might have once been attached. And looking from above, I saw a deep and narrow canyon that extended upward exactly where the split between the legs would be. I'd already been hiking this mountain for six years and been up that canyon on several occasions, but I never for a moment imagined that I might be walking between the legs of an ancient titanic creature. My mind was reeling. Could it possibly be? I thought back to the many times I'd been up to the eye. There were several smaller cave formations and channels deep within the eye, and already I'd puzzled about how such unusual formations could come about. I remembered from my anatomy studies that the eye socket of most vertebrates is composed of seven different bones that meet in lines, known as sutures. Assuming titans once existed, and that titan anatomy would mirror that of creatures of smaller scale, I concluded that if this were indeed the eye socket of a gigantic creature, then I should be able to find specific anatomical features in the cave that would directly match the anatomy of an eye socket. Such finds, if they were to occur, especially when stacked up alongside the multiple specific correlations to macroanatomy that I'd already found, would make it more difficult to brush off the similarities attributing them to chance. After all, how many coincidences does it take before one has to conclude that a recognizable pattern is beginning to emerge? All vertebrates share striking similarities when it comes to overall shape and structure of the bones that comprise the skeleton. As I looked at my anatomy books, my eyes were immediately drawn to the infraorbital foramen, a small opening that all vertebrates share just below or in front of the eye socket. Looking back to Google Earth, my jaw dropped. There, just in front of the eye socket of Mont Go, exactly where it should be found, was a smaller cave forming a channel that looked identical to an infraorbital foramen. The hairs on my arms stood on end, and they're doing it again right now as I retell this story. The unlikely number of specific features that I was finding was already, at least in my mind, bringing me far, far beyond the realm of simple pareidolia. I played enough dice and card games in my life to understand how odds work. The odds of finding all of these features were already huge. Little did I know that this was still only the infancy of my investigation, with many more unbelievable discoveries awaiting. I wanted to make sure that I didn't succumb to the classic mistake that many researchers make of cherry-picking their data and, consciously or not, warping their findings to match their theories. So, not wanting to make a fool of myself, I sought to approach the study as scientifically as I could, deciding to revisit the cave, but not until I had studied the anatomy in depth and gotten a clear list of a specific set of anatomical features that I would expect to find. It was then, following that trip to the cave, that I began to be confident that I was really onto something, no matter how absurd it seemed. Unfortunately, the other side of the mountain, where one would expect to find a second eye, 
has undergone a major collapse, so my hopes of finding a second eye were both literally and figuratively crushed. Mainstream geology calls the contorted portion of the mountain a synclinal and claims that the curved layers of strata are remnants of a previous violent collapse. But the south side, which I had already begun to explore in depth, was beautifully preserved, and I began to contemplate the existence of an ear. While taking another flight with Google Earth, I spotted a quarter-moon section of the mountain that looked a great deal like the remnants of an ear attachment. I decided to go looking for a cave there, and it was then that I found myself, undeniably, in the twilight zone. Scanning the area from above, I spotted a trailhead, and with a brief search came across the name of the canyon. It was called Barranc del Mijdia, the canyon of midday. Scanning the rest of the page, my eyes landed on another phrase, Cova del Mijdia. I knew that Cova, in Valencian dialect, meant cave. Again the hairs on my forearms stood on end, and what I discovered next was beyond belief. I won't give any spoilers here, and if you haven't seen the video series yet, be sure to watch them in order. Again, if you're a skeptic, which I encourage, I'm confident that if you make it through the first three videos, your skepticism will give way to possibility. In the fourth video, I present an in-depth analysis of the tissues of Montgo. It's a forensic analysis conducted in the spirit of a crime scene investigation. Now the funny thing about examining the tissues of a 5 kilometer long, 753 meters tall creature is that you don't need a microscope, because you are the microscope. In part 5, I revisit the eye with friends, where we make an incredible discovery. I also expose, with unequivocal video proof, blatant censorship on the part of Google Earth. Apparently, someone at Google doesn't want people to know the information I've been sharing. Needless to say, all of these discoveries were beginning to change how I saw the world around me. I started to look at all the rocks with new eyes. Is what we are told about their origins actually true? How did they actually form? Are all rocks the remains of titans? Or are there other origins as well? I begin to feel a closer connection to the world around me, realizing that much, if not all of what I walked upon, was likely the remains of gigantic creatures that lived perhaps not so long ago. Some take drugs to alter their perceptions, but the effects eventually wear off. My perception had been permanently altered, and others who've seen these videos have shared similar experiences. Somewhere between the second and the fourth video, I started to notice that the rocks on the mountain were very different from the stones in the valleys, rivers, and seashores. The differences were stark, and as I descended the mountain, there were no gradations of change as would be expected based on what we've been told about the process of erosion. On the mountain, the smaller stones were clearly jagged, fragmented bits of larger structures. But as soon as I reached the valley floor, they were completely different. There were no transition stones that were partially eroded on their way to becoming smooth. It was one or the other. I didn't understand the reason until later. The more I examined mud fossil videos looking for answers, the more frustrated I became. All too often there were videos of people showing rocks that could have been a variety of different things, yet they would regularly make confident claims that the rock was once a this or a that. Sometimes the information presented was compelling and actually made sense based on what I knew of anatomy and histology. Other times I wondered what the person had been smoking. It was this that caused me to send out a little request to the universe to send me an example of a rock with so many anatomical correlations that the finding would be completely undeniable. I wanted something as obvious as the mind-blowing evidence that I was already finding with Montgo. A few days later, walking in a dry river bottom, my request was answered. I spotted a stone that I immediately recognized to be a heart. The shape, the color, the fatty marbling, the chambers, the remains of the valves and papillary muscles, everything was still there and intact. I tried to pass my finding on to one of the leaders of the mud fossil movement. I sent a video displaying and rotating the rock 360 degrees. I thought for sure he'd recognize the rock for the exceptional specimen that it was, and even gave permission to make use of the video as he saw fit. To my surprise, he showed no interest. But confident that it was an important find, I decided to make a video of my own called Mud Fossils, The Heart of the Matter. I even purchased an endoscopic camera allowing me to film the inner chambers, 
and cataloged 17 different specific anatomical correlations to heart anatomy in that single rock. That list has now grown to over 20. How does one calculate the odds on such a thing? With the sheer quantity of anatomical correlations, I was already becoming confident that the odds of a rock taking this form being merely chance were astronomical. Then it occurred to me, if I could find one such rock, then I should be able to find others. And if I found other stones with equally specific anatomical correlations, it would suggest an emerging pattern. And with a multitude of examples, the evidence would become overwhelming. I went back to the river bottom again, this time filming as I searched, and within the first 10 minutes found over a dozen rocks exhibiting similar features. My second video on the topic, Mud Fossils The Heart of the Matter Part 2, covers that research. Up until this point, the best evidence I had about how organs or gigantic elephants could possibly be turned to stone was based on what I knew of mud fossil theory. There was already, in my mind, ample evidence in support of the idea that the world had once, or perhaps several times, undergone great cataclysms of different types and had surely been inundated by floods so great that almost everything died. Normally, upon death, flesh is consumed by microbes and larvae. Those same tissues, when encased in mud, escape such decay, because the anaerobic environment, which simply means lacking air, makes it impossible for worms and larvae and microbes to thrive. Over time, there's a slow exchange that occurs between the air and fluids found within the tissues and the minerals in the Earth's surrounding. This process, known as paramineralization, is something that mainstream geology tells us occurs over great lengths of time. Yet some researchers claim that this can happen in as little as six months, given the right conditions. Naysayers of this theory can be directed to the works of Girolamo Segato, a 19th century Italian who had the secret to petrifying human flesh. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the secret died with him in a suspicious Epstein-like death. Nevertheless, several of his petrified works remain in museums to this day as a testament to the truth that human flesh can be petrified. Skeptics can also be reminded of both the bodies at Pompeii and the prevalence of petrified wood throughout the world as examples of how biology can turn to stone. Clearly, petrification happens, and considering the shaky ground of many mainstream geological claims, all of these processes may happen far more quickly than we were led to believe. More on this later as I go into my theories about the kinds of events that lead to the findings I've made. The heartstones, which I had begun to find everywhere, were making it clear that these cataclysmic events had undoubtedly happened, and they did not likely occur millions of years ago. The more I looked, the more I was beginning to recognize similarities in the rocks. Once the shroud of mainstream geological assumptions was removed, I was able to recognize anatomical features reoccurring in the stones, and certain patterns emerged, and I started to recognize themes. I present overwhelming evidence of these themes in the video Petrified Organs, Giants' Hearts, and How to Spot Them. I also show a clear scalability. The same themes reoccur in sizes less than a quarter inch in diameter all the way up to five feet. There's a plethora of evidence for the previous existence of giants, photographic, mythological, religious, archaeological, and architectural and my findings add a significant component to that body of evidence. Despite what I was already finding with the heartstones, I'd been struggling for a while to understand, based on what I'd learned of mud fossil theory, how a creature the size of Mont Go could possibly have been covered with mud from base to summit for long enough for the process of mineral exchange to occur. It was perplexing. Where would the mud have come from? Essentially, we're talking about the floor being raised 2,500 feet and staying that way for a very, very long time, and then disappearing without a trace. It didn't make any sense to me. Nevertheless, the evidence I was finding was clear, and just because I didn't have a theory that made sense didn't mean that I should throw out the empirical evidence that I was finding in droves. I knew that, even in the absence of a proper theory to explain what I was discovering, that my findings were significant. It was the topic of Starforts that eventually led me to the penny drop, I ran across a couple of videos of Colm Gibney that were absolutely mind-blowing. Having lived in Italy and currently in Spain, I'm well familiar with castles. I've seen a great number of them, 
and had not thought twice about the mainstream wiki narrative that they were little more than bastion forts, fortifications that began to appear during the mid-15th century with thickened walls for greater defenses in response to the invention of the cannon. Little did I know that there was a oodles of evidence that, that absolutely blows the official narrative of bastion forts out of the water. I soon came across another video from a channel called Andreas Exertus, which helped me to understand that these were found in large numbers on every continent of the earth and are far older than we were led to believe. This led me to the Exertus Discord server, where I was eventually able to directly connect with a number of content providers and actually talk with some of the people who had been creating the videos I'd been watching. It's been an amazing tool and has put me in touch with a remarkable team of independent, open-minded researchers, each with broad knowledge and their own areas of expertise. To date, working in cooperation, they've mapped over 5,000 star forts worldwide, and through the rediscovery of countless old maps found in online archives, they have irrefutably proven that a great many of the great cities and towns throughout the world are actually built on or around these star fort systems. In other words, the star forts were there first. This is such an amazing topic, and this subject ties in to loads of additional research about mud floods, resets, false history, and the great empire of Tartary which virtually none of us learned anything about in school, yet it happens to be the largest empire in recorded history. It's another one of many things that makes you go, hmm. It wasn't long before I encountered a video where a few of the members of the Discord were discussing volcanoes and their impact. There's a thing that Mud Fossil University, I, I think I heard that New Earth talked about it, but I don't watch that channel, and Wise Up talks about it. What if the stone we're looking at is wood? We know fossilization happens. What is the one natural oh, yeah. instantaneous method for turning something to stone? A pyroclastic flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's the best example I can give you of a pyroclastic flow went out of hell. Yeah, <laughs> 1500 degree, three mile or 300 mile an hour. Yeah. cement lava clouds <laughs> but uh, they do have a point these things can happen we see that it's happened and turn people to stone in Pompeii so yeah. it's not a strange thing to think that half of the things we're looking at might have been wood That's might have sure. been animals you mentioned Pompeii there's the obvious yeah. Shout out to Stellium for pointing out the mammoth pyroclastic flow victim in his country. Mm -hmm. That's gorgeous. What, what happened? Where are you at? It was then a very important puzzle bit fell into place, and I began to understand how Mont Go could have become petrified, and it very likely had something to do with volcanism. There may be other explanations which I'll go into at the end of this video, but for the time being, Without venturing into the world of religion or full-blown woo-woo, I believe that the most plausible explanation for what happened to Mont Go can actually be made using geology's own words. It was then, hearing Nathan and Brittany talk, that the light bulb lit my head and I realized that their conversation actually contained the seeds of the explanatory model I've been looking for. And in the very next moment, these researchers who I held in such high regard suddenly mentioned the work I'd done on the mountain. My jaw hit the floor, another fantastic synchronicity, and one of many more that followed while collaborating in research with this team. So I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge them and send out shoutouts and heartfelt thank yous to Brittany, Nathan, Andreas, Mike, Victor, Lee, Steve, and others. You guys are a dream team, and by assisting in and embracing and sharing my research, you've given me the confidence and the motivation to continue sharing what I've learned. Many thanks. So, pyroclastic flows and lahars, could this result in a petrified titan? Or a world littered with petrified organs? I believe the answer is a resounding yes, and I'll let geology tell us about such things and make my point for me.